Good afternoon. Hey, welcome everyone to Sub Summit. It's just so great to see so many really excited marketers in the same space. And I'm so thankful that the Hilton has such great air conditioning. <laughs> Team Alliance thrilled to be here as a sponsor, uh, a presenter, and of course as attendees. Alliance is the audience company. We deliver audience solutions sourced from transactional data with advanced analytics and high performance technology that allows us to optimize marketing profitability in every channel. I have the clicker, sorry. I'm Joanne Dunn, as we heard. It's Joanne Monfredi Dunn, but most people just call me Joe. It's so much easier. I'm the CEO and founder of Alliant and a career long lover of data. Subscription marketing has played a really big role in my career. When I first started, uh, I worked for Time Inc. And in those days, subscription marketing was called continuity marketing. We sold book and music products in, in a subscription. The first product that I was charged with was the World War II book series, which I think is kind of an appropriate here in New Orleans. Uh, there were probably 40 volumes in that series. It took longer for a consumer to be a completer of the series than it did to fight the war. And we made a ton of money. And we did that because we had really good, clean data that allowed us to have a good customer experience. And that was a couple of decades ago. So the data is really a super important underpinning. Today, Alliant provides data and analytics to a variety of consumer marketing companies and has very deep experience in subscription marketing. Customer data management is really core to any business, it's, it's a core foundational discipline, and we believe it's the fuel for building a strong, successful business. Now, I'd like you to meet my partner in everything data. Hi there. My name is Malcolm Houts. I lead the data science team at Alliant. It's my job to make sure that my team has the best data, the best algorithms and methods, and the best intuition to deliver the most profitable audiences they can. We build models with fully automated machine learning pipelines, and for more complex solutions, we handcraft our models from start to finish. Thanks, Malcolm. OK, let's get into it here. We're charged with talking about five secrets of successful use of data in subscription marketing. There are a lot of secrets, but we try to pick the best. The first one is really knowing your data, having it organized, and most important, and you're going to hear this a bunch of times today, having a unified customer ID. Then adding other data or third party data to your first party data, building on that with modeling and analytics, taking modeling to the next level and customizing it especially for your company and your goal or goals, and then test it, retest it, continue to test it, and roll out and build your business and get to scale. Malcolm, kick off okay. with uh, goal number one. All right. <clears throat> Secret number one. Knowing your data is knowing your customer. In order to truly know your customer, you need to keep and organize your data. The more data you can collect, organize, clean, and make accessible, the more profitable your campaigns are going to be. Your data is an asset, and you should treat it like one. Now, before you go and start collecting you know, customer data on scraps of paper or on your phone, you should really think about the best way to house and organize your data. Um, consult with end users, gather business requirements, and vet them. Uh, some of you are going to start on a spreadsheet. Some of you have in-house database architects on staff. Keep everything that matters. You really want to Marie Kondo your data. Uh, it's, but it's hard to know. It's hard to know what to keep. It's hard to know what data really matters. Your data scientists want you to uh, keep everything. They want every scrap of data they can possibly get their hands on. They don't know what's going to pop in models. They don't know what's going to improve your segmentation until they actually have access to it. Keeping everything might be a little impractical. If you can, if you can keep it organized and maintained and up to date, then keep it. If it becomes a big pile of mess that no one can ever make sense of, then maybe it's time to let that piece of it go. Uh, unique customer IDs and timestamps on transactional data 
are absolutely fundamental to keeping your data organized. Um, also, plan for scale. Your database might be really small now. It might be a couple of spreadsheets if you're a startup company. It's going to grow, I promise you. And as, as your data grows, as your company grows, you want to avoid having data silos throughout your organization. You really want to avoid, and a lot of companies do this, and it's, it's a shame. They've got one pile of data over here for online transactions, one over here for offline transactions, one back there of third-party data that only Joe can access. Right? You really want to avoid those silos and try to bring it together in a, in a comprehensive uh, set. And finally, whether you're, whether you're using internal sources to manage your data or you're subbing it out, subbing it out to a third-party vendor, make sure that whoever manages your data has experience in subcom. Your data is really different than other marketing channels. It's really important. I've seen tons of examples where people migrate their data to a new, new provider and it just falls apart on them. Joe? Okay, thanks. All right, there are so many types and sources of data that pour into a subscription model. It really requires experience and expertise to gather it all and to keep it organized. Your prospects, your active customers, your inactive customers are all giving off really valuable data points that you can use. Um, let's take a look at a few of these that are up on the screen. All right, so that's not quite formatted properly, but it's, it's okay. So PII, right? You've got to keep PII on your, on your customers, but you also have to keep it up to date. If your customers change address and you don't maintain that, you're going to be shipping your product to the wrong address. PII is also used to, uh, as a match key. You're onboarding an audience to an online uh, onboarder. You're going to use PII to match. Um, you're going to merge to a third-party data set. You're going to use PII for that match. It's got to be accurate. See what else? Social behaviors. Social behaviors are really powerful in models. They come into predictive models all the time. If you can buy it from a third-party pr uh, provider or gather it yourself, it can be very, very powerful. Um, what else? Uh, chargebacks, cancels, returns, complaints. Okay, these are all negative behaviors. They're really powerful in predictive models. Don't just keep the positive stuff. It's really easy to say, oh, look, all my customers are great, right? Everyone has people that have canceled. Everyone has people that have returned or charged back or complained. You want to keep that data. Keep the negative as well as the positive. It's really powerful. Okay, clearly we are going to have formatting issues through this entire presentation, and thankfully none of our marketing people here because they'd be having their head spin. <clears throat> but we're going, to, we're going to power through anyway. Um, kind of a cautionary tale to build on, on Malcolm's uh, last comments. Um, we worked with a large uh, subscription health product marketer, and, and they're you know, a, good, a very at-scale business. They had significant challenges with dis desperate, disparate data that was organizationally siloed. So after years of growing and being reactive about how to make this change and that change and add this product and add this system, their data was so kludged together and their systems were so confused. If you could have seen the, the flow chart of how their business operated, it really was, it was head spinning. And what happened was they had multiple IDs for every customer, up to five IDs for a customer. So that affected their customer service. They had fractured customer view, higher churn, terrible customer service issues, costly workarounds just to get the work out. Their data organization was not set up in any way, shape, or form to scale. And that caused them to, to really have challenges even as they grew, and it continues to get worse. Now. They continue to be successful, but it's really expensive if you don't figure it out from the beginning. So you want to be able to be proactive, planful, and know that there's going to be, even no matter how well you plan, there's going to be downstage kind of unplanned consequences of changes. But the more you think about it and have the business requirements, and if you're building something in one department, and you have business requirements, you need to vet those business requirements across the organization to see what the impact is there and make sure you're designing whatever data flows, processes, software, whatever you're doing, that it's going to serve the whole organization and not get everything all tangled up because it's only going to cause further downstream problems. 
Okay. <clears throat> and number two. Well, that was quite a story. We can look at not on the uh, brighter side of things. Once you have all your data organized, curated, cleaned, uh, accessible, you can start to look outside of your CRM for other data sources. So now we're going to talk about enriching or enhancing your first party data with third party data. Data enrichment is a best practice. The more information you can layer into your CRM, the deeper your customer knowledge will be. You can start data enrichment with a third party demographic overlay appended to your CRM. A demographic, a demographic overlay will give you much more information about your customers. It'll make your segmentation, profiling, and modeling much stronger. You can also license data from data cooperatives or co-ops. This data is transactional and is sourced from hundreds or thousands of different marketers. Um, the co-op data it gives you a multi-enterprise view of your customers and transactional data is really predictive. You can also use third-party data in real time to optimize online experience and to drive uh, prospects through uh, acquisition or reactivation funnels. So additional data is very powerful. Um, I know from, from experience, if I build the best model I can with the data that I have on hand, if sometime down the road I get an additional data set, I can rebuild that model and it will be stronger. In fact, Joanne has an expression that she likes to uh, espouse. Mo data, mo better. And actually, I may say it, but the data science team walks it because they always want more data. Here's another little case study um, of the power of adding additional data to your first party data. Um, you know, on one side, there's me, and uh, by the way, the marketing team is super nice on the demographics. Uh, <laughs> so we've overlaid on this consumer that we only know bought one subscription offer and maybe was in for two or three shipments. Um, now we know what her age is, income. We know that she's college educated. We also know what her interests are, and these interests align with the product we're trying to sell, which is a, a, a subscription meal kit. And oh, look at this. We've added some transaction data that says in the last 12 months, she spent over $200 <coughs> on subscription marketing, and she has three active subscriptions. She is definitely looks like and, most importantly, acts like the customer the meal kit subscriber is looking to, to acquire. On the other side of that, we've also overlaid uh, data on, on, on Malcolm's profile, similar demographics, different interests, not well aligned with meal kits or being a foodie or liking restaurants or anything that might you know, be a good uh, match for a meal kit subscriber. But take a look at those transactions. $65 in product returns and two subscription cancels. Cancels, returns, I, you know, intro, no follow on, those kinds of things are really erode profit. So he shows very little affinity, she shows a lot of affinity, and we learn more because we added the third party data to the first party data. Your data, your, subscri your subscriber data is your first party, and there is a lot of third party data available. Much of it is descriptive, some of it is predictive if it's transactional. So we know that we're going to get a better ROI if we find more people that look like Joanne versus people that look like Malcolm. And importantly, negative behavior is so important to be able to identify. So if we know we can find a group of customers in our acquisition or in our house file that are not, predictive, not productive like Malcolm because of the negative behaviors, we're going to want to suppress those or not market to them again because it's just going to erode our profitability. So this turned out to be like a, a classic success story. Um, but we left a little piece out, which is there was probably a predictive model that was used some, somewhere in here to help find the right customers. And that leads us to uh, the next slide, which is model what matters most. Um, first off, subscription customers are different than other buyers. I've personally built models for magazine subscriptions, merchandise offers, solo book offers, and plenty of subcom offers. I'm here to tell you the people that respond to a subcom uh, offer are different than the folks that respond to the other types of offer. 
Um, we see it over and over and over again. If I build a response model for a merchandise offer and then rank a bunch of guys that subscribe to subcom offers, they, they don't rank well at all. They rank upside down. So it's really important to recognize that your folks, that your customers are really not the same buyers as those that respond to other types of offers. Not only are subcom offers different than other offers, your customers are different. Okay, model the right behavior. The benefit of all that first and third party data that you've collected and organized is that it provides more attributes that you can use for modeling or profiling or segmentation. Some of you will want to model for response. Others will model for, um, for lifetime value. Um, all these different behaviors, response, uh, payment, intro only, can all be modeled for successfully. Uh, what you want to model for might change over time. If you're a startup company, you've got you know, a very few number of um, customers, you're working out of the garage, you might model for response. So you want to just find anyone who's, who's, who's willing to respond to your promotion. If your company is a little bit more mature, you might find that you have got plenty of responders, but they're canceling, they're churning right after the intro offer, and they're not profitable for you. If you are a more mature company and you're looking a little bit further down uh, the road, you might be modeling for lifetime value or overall profitability. So where, what you model for is likely to change over time, but at some point, you're probably gonna to wanna to model for profitability. So it's really important that you understand all your customers' transactions and behaviors and the costs associated with those. If someone uh, cancels right after an intro only offer, um, what does that cost you? If you're doing def a deferred payment option and someone decides not to pay you, what does that cost you? What's the value of someone that has paid for two full price shipments? What's the value of someone that's paid for three plus shipments? You're gonna to wanna to keep this and understand it as you start to model for profitability. Modeling for subcom profit is complex. It requires what we call multi-behavioral models. A multi-behavioral model uses many, many data points to estimate the probability of several different behaviors at the same time, and I'll get into that a little bit. An example of a multi-behavioral model is one that was built to maximize high lifetime value, but at the same time, minimize the probability of chargebacks and also minimize the probability of canceling right after the intro offer. Uh, the model was built for a health and beauty subscription company, and some of the negative and positive uh, predictors that went into the model are on the board. Now, this is a small subset. There was probably 50 or 60 variables that went into this model. Here we have just six of them. But if you look at the, the top left-hand corner, uh, partnership sources are more likely to charge back than are other sources. I mean, that's sort of, maybe it's intuitive. Some of, these, some of you partners are incentivized to just jam people through the funnel. Well, who knows who they're pushing through? Some of them are gonna be higher quality than others. Um, so that's, it's a very believable uh, variable in the product. If you look at the uh, type, uh, top right-hand corner, households with at least one payment among their last two transactions are less likely to charge back. If I'm a good payer, I'm not gonna get on the phone call and start whining to my credit card company. Uh, and finally, the lower right-hand corner, households whose uh, ratio of online orders to offline orders is higher are more likely to stick around for at least two shipments. Okay, if I'm really active online as opposed to offline and you're promoting me through an online offer, I'm more likely to be sticky. So just an example of some of the um, variables that were used in the model. And by themselves, none of these models, oh, none of these variables are particularly powerful. But when put together in concert with each other, it really results in a very predictive model. In fact, this model uh, improved lifetime value by 27% for this client. So you can buy off-the-shelf audiences that find prospects that look like your typical customers. These audiences are built using demographic information such as age, income, gender, uh, household, uh, do you own uh, home ownership if you're lucky? Um, but a modeled audience that's gonna find prospects that behave and purchase like your best customers. Again, models can help you avoid the one and done guys. They can, they can help you avoid, if you have a deferred payment program, people who are not gonna pay you. They can help you find higher lifetime value guys. That's such an important slide. Um, not a lot of words, but the message about 
finding audiences that behave like your best customers. A lot of audiences will look like a customer you may want to acquire, but the behavior is really key. So learn about the behaviors of your customers that are good and profitable and work at finding more and modeling is certainly um, the way to make that happen, or at least a way to make that happen. Okay, we're powering right along to uh, secret number four, um, which is embrace customization, which means taking modeling and data and analytics to the next level. Um, clearly, there are a lot of um, solutions in market. I'm gonna go right off my text here, I'm sorry. Malcolm just went through a pretty complex um, solution, but at the, at the base, subscription marketing is really a complex business model in, in a variety of ways. So to meet the goal, you really need to embrace that customization. A lot of models out there are in platforms and partners and are black box. That means we have no idea what's in that box. We don't know what attributes. We don't know what algorithms are driving that model. And a lot of them work, but do they work well enough? And is that the best solution? Malcolm, why don't you take us um, into uh, goal number four, or number four. All right, well, I, I, can defend, I can defend black box models a little bit. They do have their place in time. Um, they, can be in, they can be effective and they can be uh, convenient. Uh, perhaps a great place to start for some companies. Uh, there's a, definitely a time and place for them. Um, digital platforms uh, optimize audiences using uh, black box modeling in real time. Right? And that's very appropriate. You don't want your analyst calling up Facebook uh, or you know, texting them, oh, don't, don't deploy my audience yet. I want to dig under the hood of the, of the algorithm you're going to use. That's never going to happen and it wouldn't make sense. Right? So real time black box uh, modeling, you don't necessarily need to know what's going into it if you're optimizing an audience uh, in real time. But, but Joanne's right, for, for a complex modeling objective such as subcom profitability, you really want to have an experienced modeler handcrafting a model for you. Um, that said, uh, the, modeling the, the modeling pipeline can be partially automated. It can include uh, machine learning algorithms. But you need someone looking at your data. You just can't let it be driven entirely by artificial intelligence. And if you don't believe us, put it to the test. A home service a subscription company recently tested um, some handcrafted modeled audiences compared to Facebook modeled audiences. Um, the handcrafted model audiences incorporated e-commerce data, transactional data, uh, demographic, lifestyle data. The Facebook audience incorporated, I don't know, I can't tell you, because it was a black box algorithm. You have no idea what, what went into it. Um, the modeled solutions um, outperforming the Facebook uh, audiences with an 18% higher uh, conversion rate. And uh, not only that, but those who did uh, convert uh, had a higher lifetime value in, uh, in, with a long tail. You know, three months later it was reevaluated, and so far they had a higher lifetime value. Okay, goal number five. Now we've put all the right data to work. We've done modeling. We're ready to use it. Testing. Test, test, retest. And you can test in a myriad of different ways in pretty much every channel and get the results you need to get control. What's the control that, you, that is going to drive your business? And then you continue to retest, and you always want to out, out, outperform the control and continue to grow your business. So you've got all this data that you're using. You're using analytics to drive profit, but you can also use it to be creative. Think about using the data and listening or watching what the data tells you to be more creative by curating or better curating the customer relationship and building community around your product. To develop new product, to drive new content to the right consumer and the right channel at the right time, and you know, all of this all these behaviors you are in charge of using data and analytics to speak to your customers, to create that relationship and to drive scale into your business. Final use case. We talked about a home service subscription company before who tested with Facebook and then we built them a custom model that outperformed Facebook on its own. Um, 
these guys are really smart. They um, use data in a lot of different ways in their business. Uh, they really lean into it. They um, have a real-time capability that allows them to generate qu high quality leads in, at scale in real time. And um, by incorporating models and third party data, they're able to qualify the lead source. This is my best lead source. I can open this up and bring more of those folks in. This one's kind of medium, I'm gonna watch it. This is not such a good source. I'm gonna drop that back and maybe cut it all together. But at the end of the day, what they're doing is identifying a lead source that's giving them leads that are not only clicking, they're converting, and they're creating a long-term, high-value, good, sticky customer. Because we're adding the data at the front end of the funnel to identify good lead, bad lead. And, and that's been super successful for them, and, it, it, and um, it's a super easy um, technology to, to build out and, and, and to drive scale if you're using lead gen. Oh, oh well, one more bonus <laughs> secret. Don't, don't answer yet. Um, and I'm going to let Joanne take this one because she is the compliance queen. I have always wanted to be queen my entire life. That's why I sat down through the whole performance here. Right, the whole. Anyway, um, but compliance is really not something I ever aspired to be queen of. Although I have to tell you, I, I think compliance is, is probably one of the most important things to think about. It's, it's the slide is terrible. I'm so slow. No, it's not too bad. Okay, so compliance. That means care and feeding of your data so that we are taking care of us, every single one of us, the consumer. Each one of us, we're, we're running businesses, we're, we're building businesses, we're managing data, we're, we're, we're driving marketing strategy, but we're all consumers. And all of our customers are consumers. And our job is to be sure that the data about all of us is secure and used properly. Now, for decades, um, marketers have had the privilege of self-regulating the use of marketing data. And that is really being challenged right now. How many of you guys know what CCPA is? Yeah, this is good. Okay, CCPA, for those of you who don't, is the California Consumer Privacy Act. California is, ahead of, is, is, is charging mighty hard on regulating the use of data in a very broad, sweeping way that would be very difficult for many of us. Now, a lot of you say, our company's too small to have to worry about complying with CCPA. Well, that's that may be true. However, your providers are not. And you, you need to make sure that their contracts with you are in line and compliant with the California laws, as well as the 11 other states that are trying to drive <coughs> laws through at the same time. So at the end of the day, having 50 different state laws to comply with is, would just be I mean, that makes my hair hurt thinking about it. That, none of us want that, um, except for maybe the state's attorney generals. Um, so what we do need is a preemptive federal law. And there's a coalition called uh, Privacy for America Coalition. And if you go online, you can find their website. I would ur urge you to get behind that in any way you can. Ask your clients to get behind that. Ask your partners to get behind that. Because if we can get a federal law that it gives us one law to be able to protect us, the consumer, and our customers, and, and importantly, our businesses, and the ability to use data to grow our businesses uh, will be a whole lot better off. So as we look at all these secrets, adding the sixth secret, I personally think that number one, knowing your data, getting that unified consumer ID, and number six, compliance, are the most important bookends. Because if you've got those in place, then you build the rest of this, you're gonna drive scale in your business. I'm gonna take questions here, but I wanted to read something because we have a few minutes left. I just got this email today from our chief product guy, and it's um, some trends that I think are relevant to the conversation. Uh, from Adobe, Adobe released these uh, this week, their annual digital trends report in partnership with eConsultancy. Survey was about 13,000 marketers, creatives, IT professionals, brands, and agencies. 
Here are some highlights. Data is seen as a game changer. Its use, control, and ownership was a dominant theme. 55% of marketers say they have prioritized better use of data this year. 63% of IT professionals say data collection and unification ranks among the very top priorities. Digital first companies are 64% more likely to have significantly exceeded their top 2018 business goals. And finally, 36% of larger, larger organizations are using AI, particularly to enhance data analytics, and 50%, that, which is 50% more than last year. All that backstop is kind of what we've been talking about. So does anyone have any questions? <coughs> yes, sir? Yes, sir. We've driven a, um, a very successful, uh, Alliance started out as an offline company, very heavily into the subscription marketing. And it, we have transformed into a digital first company. And um, our offline data in concert with other sources of online data have been very successful in driving acquisition and retention. Um, Malcolm, what do you want to add, add to that? I can add a little bit more to that. So the, the data that, you know, we're not trying to advertise our company, but the, the, the data that, that we use does, is, is sourced from, from actual transactions. And you know, e even, if we're using, even if we're using some offline transactions for an online model, we're very cognizant of that. And things like um, you know, online buyers are typically going to be younger. And, you know, there's a whole suite of things that sort of define who's going to be who. But yet, we know that if we have the right dependent variable, if we have a pile of buyers that have bought from your program, even though our, our data may have been sourced from a variety of different sources, it's, the model is still accurate. And we, see, we do see it over and over again that the, the custom models that we build, uh, given a client's dependent variable and our data, and some outsourced data that we bring in-house, it, it, is, it is very predictive. I'm not sure if that's answered your question or not. I'm trying to. OK. Yes, sir. You know, um, our clients use a variety of, of, of different platforms. Uh, we don't prescribe to recommend any platforms, uh, but I would say as a small company, there are probably a dozen or so different uh, platforms that you, you could use, uh, you know, until you're scaled up to, you know, thousands, you know, tens of thousands of customers. And then you may even be able to go to a small provider and let them um, help you with that. I. I I wouldn't want to guess on who you should use at this stage. Anything else? The data that you can get from your um, platform that you're doing your business on, the Shopify or the e-commerce, what can you do with that data? I mean, how would you start asking, advising them to begin to get that data to decide which of these Google-like customers you should be? When you say that data, do you mean that's your data on their platform? Yeah. On their platform. Okay. Well, I, ideally, you can enrich that with some additional data. Um, you know, a demographic overlay is one thing that we talked about. So now you've got you've got your customer, their name and address, their email address, and you've got how frequently they've bought from you in the past. But now you can layer in what's their age, what's their gender, what's their income, what's their education level, and, that, that, and that's going to help you. That, that's going to be helpful. Now, if you're 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 buying an off-the-shelf audience. 
um, you know, you can, you, can, you, you can tell Google, you can tell Facebook, I only want to promote to these people that fit into this profile. Um, that's sort of a, you know, a, a baby step or an initial step. Eventually, you'd like to be able to start building predictive models that really hone in on, on, on the behaviors that we've been talking about. That's going to be a little bit difficult. Um, that's not true. You, you can absolutely build models with just demographic data. It would be kind of difficult with just your own house data, right, to, to, to apply to a prospect. Right? You have your house data, your house transactions. You can find some inter interesting things in there, but you can't really apply that to a prospect audience because you don't have the same information on them. If you're, if you're doing uh, a, a, um, a retargeting campaign or a reactivation campaign, then you absolutely can just use your own data. The people that have stuck with you for you know, more than five shipments, whatever the number is, are more likely to respond to a reactivation effort. I mean, it's common sense, but you can find out right, the, the, the point of who you should pr promote to and who you shouldn't. Um, so using just your data, you can, you can create profiles and you can create um, you know, simple models for reactivation or cross-sell, but it's going to be difficult to apply that to a prospect universe. Can we take that next step to take it to decide who's, like you were saying, what's the next step to get that retention management system in place? She's talking about her house file. How does she learn more about that? Okay, another prospect audience. Based sure. on your house file. Okay, yeah, ba ba based, on your, based on your house file alone, it's going to be pretty difficult unless you've captured things like a, you know, some basic demographics about your customers. And, and transactions, but they can, right. she can use the transactions from her house file to find customers that look like hers through acquisition. If, 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 the, um, if the prospect data has those types of transactions on it. Um, you don't get her Okay, so so okay, so so you can you can go to you can go to a third-party data provider, typically a cooperative database that has transactions on on you know the entire you know U.S. population, and you can say okay, give me um, people that have you know five or more subcom transactions in the last in the last year, or give me uh, folks that have uh, subscribed to at least two different subcom programs in the past two years or something like that. Okay, so there are companies out there that do have that data, right? They're, 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 cooperative, data, they're cooperative databases. Any other questions? All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, Would you like to take a few minutes? They, uh, if you go to our website, alliantinsight.com backslash or forward slash sub toolbox, there's lots more information on subscription marketing and, and modeling uh, for success.